Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm Ryan Mauser back once again. Uh, it's The All-Star game has happened. The All-Star break is going on until Thursday, so we don't have any games yet. So I hope you enjoyed the All-Star game. I ended up, di- I did watch the first quarter and then kind of figured what was happening was going to happen. And Team LeBron finished it off and got a, the, the win and won every single quarter. So it was pretty big domination by them I mean their team was fully stacked just I mean you look at their starting lineup of Giannis Steph LeBron Luka and Jokic that's formidable and then with the fact that Durant was out Joel Embiid was out and Ben Simmons were all out for team Durant it was kind of a no-brainer that team LeBron was gonna get the win so dunk contest happened and for me Simons is the winner of that one three-point contest Steph Curry surprise surprise Wins the three point contest and, and it, that was a fun one. That was came down to the last basketball being shot. Mike Conley put up a good fight, but Steph ultimately did win the three point contest. The second time he's done that, so it was it was overall uh, a good little All Star weekend. I, I still think that it was kind of unnecessary, but it's all right. And so we look ahead to the second half of the season that's going to get going here on Thursday. Uh, big news of the day and weekend, I guess, is. Blake Griffin, who officially signed with the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, Blake, who got bought out by the Detroit Pistons, had a number of teams that obviously were interested in bringing him in. He ultimately chose to go to the Nets. And so I wanted to take a look at this, and we'll get into what teams uh, could be buyers and sellers at the trade deadline and the buyout market, as well as players and who are likely to get bought out and where would be a good fit, how they could possibly help a team. And so we'll get to all of that uh, as we go on. But let's start with the Blake Griffin news. And obviously the Nets made the big move for James Harden. And that was the the sh- pushing all the chips to the table and saying, we're going all in for this. We have Kevin Durant. We have Kyrie Irving. We want a title. And that's that is we have the guys right now. We have the window. Let's just go all in. And so you have this team who they gave up a decent amount in the James Harden deal already, so their bench wasn't as strong as it has been in the past. Uh, the, the team, the Nets, when they were uh, with the D'Angelo Russell, it was kind of built on their depth. They surrounded D'Lo, and this team, it's very top-heavy. I mean, you have Kevin Durant, James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and now you bring in Blake Griffin. And so I, I, I talked a bit, a couple, I think it was on my debut podcast episode for GSMC of... I didn't think the Nets were the true title favorites. Um, they're definitely a a favorite to make it to the finals and to run through the East and get there. Um, to win it all, though, I, I still am hesitant, even with this move of Blake Griffin being added, because it comes down to the number one thing that worries me about the Nets. And that's the fact that they don't have very good defense and they can't really stop anybody and that they've been giving up lots of points. Now, they're going to outscore everyone in the the league. They they have the firepower that they just, they're lethal. I mean, you have two of the great, three of the greatest shooters. Kevin Durant, probably the greatest scorer going on in the game right now. He's he's unstoppable. A healthy KD, and right now he's been dealing with the hamstring that's causing them to miss uh, some games lately and miss the All-Star game. 
But this team, health-wise, is one of the scariest teams, and on the offensive side specifically. But when it for the playoffs, I always look at and think, you need to be able to stop someone. Because every team that's in the playoffs is a pretty good team. That they're, They made the playoffs. doesn't matter what the record is. They were able to get in the playoffs. They're the best of the best of the group. For the Nets, though, they will be the favorite coming out of the East. I, I think they they edge out the Sixers in terms of people's appeal that they are they have more talent. But they can't stop anybody is what concerns me. I mean, yes, their offense is light years, it seems, ahead of everyone else. If you want to steal that Joe Lakeup line of the light years. They're averaging 121 points a game, which is easily first. But then on the defensive side of opponents' points per game, is they're giving up 116. That's 27th out of 30 teams in the NBA. That's what concerns me about the Nets. And I still have those concerns. Because even in bringing in Blake Griffin, and you're adding another star. Now, granted, he's not the same Blake Griffin that he was in Lob City with the Clippers. He's had some injury problems. He doesn't have the same burst. and He's not going to be able to give you much, if anything, on the defense side of the ball, which that was my big concern and still is with the Brooklyn Nets, is that, yeah, they're going to be able to score with everybody, everybody, but if they have an off-shooting night, which, again, you have James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Durant, it's unlikely that all three of those guys are going to have a rough night and not be able to hit anything. But if they have even an off night, and they run into a team like the Sixers or like the Bucks in the playoffs, and they are not scoring at the level of what they have been. They can't stop the other team from scoring. And at the end of the day, like you need to be able to stop someone. Yeah, you can score with the rest of them, but if you're just trading back and forth, it's all going to come down to who has the last shot. And the Nets are confident that if they had the last shot, they're going to win because they have Kevin Durant or James Harden or Kyrie Irving. And when you have one of those guys and they have three of them, there's not many other guys in the league that you'd rather have the ball in their hands. And they have three of those guys. So it's fair that they think, hey, let's just outscore everyone. If if we outscore everyone, we have nothing to worry about because no one in the league can, can top us. But you need to be able to get stops. And they can get stops here and there. But again, their opponents are averaging 116 points a game. There's no signs that their defense is going to get better. Uh, There's no one that's going to come back and make this team a defensive stalwart. It's it's not there. They don't have anyone. And they they I thought the better move, and we'll get to him later on, who uh, in our people who could be bought out or traded for. But I thought if Andre Drummond became available, that could be a a better fit than bringing in Blake Griffin, because again, Blake Griffin will give you some. On the offense, he'll be able to score. He hasn't had a dunk in a while, which is weird because Blake Griffin was known for his dunks. But again, he's not the same Blake Griffin that we had five years ago where he was jumping over cars or doing all those things. It's 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 a Blake Griffin that has changed his game. And yeah, he was only averaging 12.3 points a game this year, but he was playing on the Pistons and he wasn't necessarily taking control and asserting himself so you look at it and they, it's adding that kind of star power to the nets and you look and you go okay well this team should easily be the favorites coming out of the east well i don't think so because you have the sixers who for the sixers they have joel Embiid playing at an mvp level he could be considered an mvp favorite at the moment and if you have that I, who is stopping Embiid in this game in the game for the nets deandre jordan can't do that Blake Griffin's not going to be able to do that. All right, if you want to match Kevin Durant on him, that's fine. But Embiid outweighs Kevin Durant by quite a bit and is just overall a bigger guy. It's more likely that Kevin Durant's going to be matched up on probably a Ben Simmons type because you're going to want that length against Simmons and the quickness. But again, who you who do you have to stop Joel Embiid? And that's the matchup for the Sixers. And the Sixers can shoot. They have Seth. They have Seth Curry. They have Danny Green. Tyrese, not Tyrese Halliburton. Um, Matisse Thybul has gotten better at shooting. So you look at the Philadelphia 76ers, who currently are the team that is ahead of the Brooklyn Nets in the standings. 
and you think that team would would give them a run and make it tough on them because they can do so many things. And the Sixers' defense is better than the Nets. So you would think, all right, well, that'd be a good matchup, but the Sixers, they can't match the firepower that the Nets have because they can't score the same. But granted, they're scoring 114 points a game, but their defense, they're only giving up 111, which is 11th. And again, 11th to 27th in defensive rating. That's where... That's where my big concern is for the Nets. Because, again, they will be able to outscore many teams and put up shots and put up points all throughout a game. But can you get a stop when you need to? Do you have that stop, that that defensive stopper? Ben Simmons is playing like a defensive player of the year right now. Joel Embiid, we know that he is a rim protector and can shut down anyone in the paint. The Nets can't do that. And then if you want to look at the head coaches and who would have the advantage in terms of head coach. Well, Doc Rivers has been there, done that. Steve Nash is going to be, of all the coaches that will make the playoffs, will be the least experienced because this is his first year, his first time being a head coach, let alone a coach. He wasn't an assistant. He he was a helper with the Warriors or a special assistant, I guess. But he hasn't been in that, that day-to-day, game-in, game-out type of role. So he's learning on the fly. And yeah, you have the talent that he has. You don't have to do as much. But it looks like I, I, I'd i lean with the Sixers being a favorite over the the Nets for the simple fact of everything kind of tends to go with them as far as like coaching. Shoot, I don't want to say shooting, but they, they do shoot the ball well and have guys who can make shots. But that the defensive factor of Simmons and Embiid, because Simmons could go on KD, and I'm not going to say he's going to stop him. But he can make things really difficult for him. He's long. He's lanky. He's strong. And it, it, it would be a tough matchup for KD in and out. So you take away, I don't want to say take away KD, but you limit him. And so now, if they're not shooting the same, if KD's only getting, let's say, 20 a night, or he has a game in a series where he only scores 11 or 15, and James Harden, we've seen how James Harden can go cold. We've seen Kyrie Irving go cold. If they have a cold series, they are in trouble because they're not going to be able to stop these teams. It's it's just where they're at. They don't have the defensive capability of these other squads. Let's take a look at the Milwaukee Bucks, who they could match up with in, in the East. and Where would they stand against them? And would it be a rough go for them? Would they be able to stop them? Now, the Bucks, who are second behind the Nets in points per game, obviously can score but they have their own defensive issues that go on. And so you would look, I would probably trust the Nets over the Bucks. That's fair. If both teams aren't the greatest de- de- defensive-wise, then you go, okay, well, the Nets have the better players all around. The Bucks have Giannis, who back-to-back MVPs, was just named the All-Star Game MVP. You give him his dues, and obviously he's one of the top three, four players in the league. But the Nets have Kevin Durant who healthy and it looks like he's getting once he gets back to that point we saw him earlier in the season he was looking just as good as Kevin Durant has in the past so those two you can cancel each other out I'd say so look at look at the number twos which would probably be I would say James Harden gets the nod over Kevin Kyrie Irving as the Brooklyn Nets number two guy he's better than Chris Middleton it's not even close James Harden is a Top five, top six player in the league, former MVP, scoring champion, overall is a better player than Chris Middleton. No offense to Chris Middleton, who is an excellent player. So there's the advantage right there for the Nets. Their number threes, Drew Holiday over Kyrie Irving. Drew Holiday is a great defender, and you would see him probably matched up on on James Harden in this series. I think you put Giannis on Kevin Durant if it happened. And okay, Drew Holiday is a great defender. But he's not going to give you the points Kyrie's going to do. He's not going to be able to shoot like Kyrie, get others involved like Kyrie. Again, the Nets would have the advantage. You look at the head coaching and you think, okay, well, Mike Budenholzer, who has been there, done that, been in playoffs, been in games, have gone has gone deep, versus Steve Nash. And you look and you go, okay, well, we'd probably lean for Budenholzer because he's been there. He, he has that experience. But again, in with the talent that is on the Nets, 
you would lean that the Nets would be the favorite. So of the top two teams or their top two teams that they could face, the Nets and the Sixers, yes, you could see the Nets having an, an easier time with the Bucks, but I think that would be a tough, tough matchup for the Sixers. And it's why sitting right now, I think the Sixers are the favorites to come out of the East. They have the guy playing like an MVP. They have the guys capable of stopping the Nets scoring. And they have guys that can make the Nets pay for the fact that they can't stop anybody. Now, things can change. Stuff can happen. Injuries pop up. Uh, Someone has a bad night. Some stuff goes wrong. We've seen the Sixers in the past look good in the regular season. And then the playoffs come, and they're not the same team. They're just – they – they don't have the same chemistry or finishing ability in a series. And it's one of the reasons why it's it's now or never for the Sixers. Because they were that young team that was ahead of the curve and were trust the process and they're making strides and they're chipping away at it. Well now it's it's been quite a few years. They've had some playoff failures, and it's it's about time to see what Simmons and Embiid can do together, and can they get this done? Otherwise, you might have to blow it up. And for the Sixers, you had the question of, well, would it be Embiid or would it be Simmons that you keep? And coming into the season, you probably thought, well, you'd go with Ben Simmons, right? A little bit younger, healthier. He can give you more versatility, He just can't shoot that well. Uh, He refuses to shoot also. But Joel is playing like an MVP now, and he's being the dominant force that everyone has waited to see year in and year out. And if you're getting that, well, okay, then you'd keep Embiid. So this is the big year for this team, is can you win with both guys? Because they don't want to trade one of these guys. They They drafted this way to pair them and to have them these young guys grow together now in the years past we they've ran into issues and chemistry has been questioned about those two but so right now it's it seems to be working and we'll just have to see once the playoffs start and how they fare but I'd say right now heading into this season the Sixers are the favorite out east as opposed to the Nets now We'll see what happens. Could the Nets go out and find a defensive guy? Well, we'll, we'll get into that with the with the buyout market lingering and approaching as it's already kicked off with Blake Griffin getting bought out. There are some names that I was looking at today thinking where could they fit in? Where would be a spot that you could realistically see them want to go? Because anybody that gets bought out isn't going to go to a, a crappy team. They're going to leave and go find a team that they can play for to try and win a championship. And so that's what I want to get into next is talking about those guys. Again, Blake Griffin is officially a Brooklyn Net. Does it help them? Were they already a, were they already the favorite? I, I say no. I say they weren't. Adding Blake Griffin does not push them in my eyes to be more higher up. It's a move that, okay, it's a nice move and you can kind of let, Bruce Brown go back to they coming off the bench role. It adds another guy to them and a a star level player. Now he's not the same star level player that he once was. So it'll be interesting how he mixes in. Does he automatically get the starts? Does that push Joe Harris to the bench? What 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 do these lineups look like for the Nets? And how will they they go small? Is Blake Griffin gonna play the five? It'll be interesting what Steve Nash does with this team. It's interesting adding Blake Griffin. I will give them that and to watch what happens and to see how they fare together. Obviously, DeAndre Jordan, Blake Griffin were teammates in Lob City with the Clippers. And they came short of their expectations. They always wanted a championship. They didn't get that there. So they're hoping that together now they can help the Nets bring it because they're not going to be the two focal points. On that team, it was you had Chris Paul... Blake Griffin, DeAndre Jordan, that was the pecking order. Here, DeAndre Jordan's not even an offensive focus for the most part. He's catching lobs and getting rebounds. And Blake Griffin, you're going to have to see what you can get from him because this year it hasn't been the same. It's been a little tough. He's only played in the 20 games, averaging 12 points a game. 
And the pressure's not on him. He doesn't have huge ex- expectations. It's not coming in and you have to lead these guys. You have to be the top scorer. It's come in, be a part of this team, and contribute in that way. So it could be helpful for Blake Griffin. And the Nets might have made one of the best moves by taking him, even if it was keeping him off another team. Because he could have gone to other teams and maybe helped them more. Maybe been better situation-wise for a team. And the Nets said, you know what? We're not going to risk it. We're not going to let him go anywhere else. We're going to bring him in. We already have a great team. We already have some great shooting. He can only add to that and not hurt us. And we keep him from going to a rival. So it's an interesting move. You can't blame the guy for wanting to go there. But we'll have to see if it works out for the Nets or not. Because I, I still think give the Sixers the edge in being the favorite coming out of the East. They can score. They can lock you up. But the Nets will be really fun to watch the rest of the way, as they have been all year. But the Blake Griffin move... It's a fun it's a fun thing to hear, but in terms of actually pushing them further into being a favorite, I'd say it doesn't do much for it. At least for me, you can feel free to disagree and let me know that you disagree. Tweet me at Mr. Meowser at GSMC Basketball. Let us know what you think if the Blake Griffin move is has solidified the Nets as the clear cut favorite or not. Because for me, it just it it. It continued to be top-heavy and didn't improve them in the areas where I thought they were weak at. So we'll get into next is the buyout market and the trade market and see what guys could be available, what could happen, where could they fit in. It's the GSMC Basketball Podcast. I'm Ryan Mauser. We'll be right back. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines, they got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So we discussed in the last segment that Blake Griffin, who was bought out by the Pistons, goes and signs with the Brooklyn Nets, and he forms a new Big Four in Brooklyn. So we'll see how that happens. I still don't have them as the clear-cut number one favorite. Uh, They're still a favorite, definitely. You still have to look at them as being one of the top potential teams to make the finals and even win the whole thing. Does Blake Griffin going there push them over the edge? I'm going to say no. I just, I don't see it. I think that they still need defensive help. That's been their biggest problem with this new squad is that they can't stop anybody. They can outscore everyone in the league and pretty easily dominate games and blow people out. But you need some stops. That's also part of the game is you need to keep the ball from going in the basket. And right now, The Nets can't do that, and with the addition of Blake Griffin, that doesn't help them do that. So I want to look at some of the buyout potential people who maybe could help Brooklyn or other teams at getting stops, and and, or just in general a buyout candidate who can help the a team. And these are the most likely candidates. They're not all going to happen. Some might be a trade. I'm looking at it right now as who could be bought out because that that's what tends to happen a lot of times is that these guys who are on these not great teams are looking to, who've already been paid pretty well, established, and got their big contracts. And teams are trying to get off of that. They don't they don't want that for the next year. They're hoping, all right, let's 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 cut our cut our losses. We paid paid for them. And it just it didn't work out for us. Or this guy was acquired from a trade. 
and it just was ne- he's never been in their long term plans. He just got moved because it worked out to make the money happen and for players happening. So these are going to be some candidates, and these names are again. There's no guarantee that they get traded or bought out. This is what just I imagine being helpful additions. So the first guy I want to start with is George Hill. Now, George Hill, who was acquired this offseason by the Thunder, was a part of that uh, big four-team trade that involved the Bucks, the Pelicans, the Thunder, and I can blank it on the other team. But he was he was traded this offseason to the Thunder. And obviously, he's not in their long-term plan. They're building for the future. It's why they've stockpiled all those draft picks. And they have Shea Gilgis Alexander, who is their guy of the future and going to be their primary ball handler. George Hill is a solid veteran. He's been to the playoffs. He's been deep in the playoffs. He's been to the finals. He hasn't won it yet. But he can provide a lot on a team coming off the bench. If you need him to start a game, he can do it. He's only played in 14 games this year. And he's averaging 11.8 points a game this season. Now, we've seen George Hill make the finals with the, with the Cavs uh, in 2018 with LeBron. And those guys, they lost to the Warriors. If he hits a free throw, maybe that series is a bit different. But he he's a veteran that's been around the league that has been in the playoffs and made contributions to teams. I mean, he was with the Spurs. He's been on those teams. He's been with the Pacers. When the Pacers were really giving the Miami Heat trouble and pushing them. There was the Eastern Conference Finals with Paul George, Roy Roy Hibbert, and George Hill was a big part of those teams. So you look, if he he came on to a number of teams, he he could help be that backup point guard, solidify this this sixth, uh, sixth man role or that second unit and just be a stabling force for any team. So he makes a lot of sense. He's been in the league 14 years now, so it's he he's he is a big time veteran. He's been around. He's seen many things. Nothing surprises him. You know what you're gonna get from George Hill. Now is he gonna come in and ball out and just lead your team? No, of course not. He's gonna be the sixth man of the year. No, he's not. But you don't need that. You you don't necessarily need that guy who is going to be coming over, coming in and taking over a game. It's you want him as a stabling force, as a guy who you can look to. It's if we need a if we need a basket, if we need someone to just calm down the team and get us back in the right motion and the right flow and get the ball moving. You look at a team like could the Sixers use him? They need a backup point guard to really be a true point guard because Seth Curry, if he's playing that role, he's not necessarily going to be that. You don't have you don't want Tyrese Maxey. Being the first point guard off the bench, you want him more of a scoring guard, but you also want him not to have so much pressure on running the show because he, he is a young guy. Having that George Hill veteran presence can really help the Sixers in terms of a stabling force with the second unit and just overall allow them to rest Ben Simmons more or even play him off the ball where you don't need him to be running everything every now and then. But if you did pair him with George Hill... George Hill can play off the ball, and it provides some more shooting that Ben Simmons can offer. So for the Sixers, I think that's a that's a big potential target. Now, he might not be bought out, and you may have to trade for him. But again, he's, only, he's 34, so you're not going to be getting a huge big contract from him. It's not going to be something where your long-term planning is, oh, how do we acquire George Hill and have him be our guy? It's, it's a use him now. And have him for the rest of the season and hopefully a deep playoff run. So it'll be very interesting to see where he could land. He's been 38% from the three this season. He shot 50% from the field. So you're getting a solid player. You could also see this guy who I, I don't know if he'll be traded. It's there's the so Kyle Lowry is who I'm thinking of. Kyle Lowry. Obviously, the Raptors have playoff hopes and championship goals. That that's where they're at. They're they're in the playoff race. They're in the mix. They've had a pretty good run after a very very awful start. But again, you look at this Raptors team, and it seems that they have a ceiling this year. 
there is no Kawhi Leonard coming to this team and pushing them over the top. It's just, it's not happening. Siakam has struggled at times. Van Vliet, Van Vliet has been everything they hoped for when they, they paid him this offseason. He's come through. He is their guy of the future. That is their point guard of the future. It's Fred Van Vliet. For Kyle Lowry, it's not the same. He's now 34. He, they got their ring with him. And for that, they should be eternally grateful. And it's an awesome thank you, Kyle, for all your contributions to the Raptors and the Raptors organization. But the two should probably be looking to move off each other. I mean, Kyle Lowry, it's it's the last year of his deal. He'll be a free agent here coming up. And so you look at him and you go, all right, well, if he's potentially on his way out, we we there is a he is a big contract guy. He did get paid, but it is the last year of a deal. So you have that expiring contract to where you could trade him somewhere and it's not going to be on the books for next year for a team. He could be that point guard who a team like Miami. You look at Miami could really use a Kyle Lowry if they, if they wanted to make that another deep playoff run and get back to the finals. They could have a stabling force at the point guard position in Kyle Lowry. Goran Dragic has been hurt this season. Tyler Hero is not going to be your point guard. Jimmy Butler, you don't need him running the show exactly. So you would like a guy like a Kyle Lowry who could come in for the year, try and win a title, and then at the end of the season, if you wanted to bring him back next year, you can, but you're not tied to him. So I'd look for Kyle Lowry to be mentioned in trade talks, maybe shopped around a bit by the Raptors. Because again, it, it seems for the Raptors, they 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 aren't winning the title this year. They just they don't have the quite the same pieces. Now, could they look to acquire those pieces at the deadline? Of course. And I'll I'll get to teams who could be buyers and could be sellers coming up. I'd look for them to probably maybe even move off Kyle Lowry and extend their window or maybe open up a window by moving off him and bringing in a, a different piece. It just seems that the two could be in line for a split. Now they could just roll it out and keep it going for the season and let him finish off his Raptors career in whatever effort he gives them and wherever they finish in the playoffs and say, thank you, Kyle Lowry for your contributions. But most likely he's not going to be back with the Raptors last year, next season. I I, I don't see it happening. They paid Fred Van Vliet to be the guy and to moving forward. That should be, it should be where they're, they're heading. And so Kyle Lowry could be on the move very easily. And, now, it is a little bit tricky to to go and get him. He does have that $30 million salary, so you'd have to find some team that can match up the money. It is nice that it's an expiring contract, so you can move off of it after this season and you're not married to the guy. But he knows how to knock down big shots. We saw it in the 2019 finals. The Raptors don't win that without Kyle Lowry. Yes, Kawhi was phenomenal, But Lowry was huge in that series, along with Van Vliet and along with Siakam. But you just, Kyle Lowry would be able to make those big shots and you'd trust him to take those shots. So I think that would be someone to keep your eye out for. Is he guaranteed to get moved? Not a chance. Could he be moved? 100%. It it, it just makes sense for the Raptors and where they're at in terms of this season and how it got going and where they might be looking towards for the future. So I'd keep my eyes on George Hill. Kyle Lowry has two point guards that can go and help a team right away. Now, it would be different roles. Kyle Lowry, you'd probably be looking for him to be a starter. I don't see him coming off the bench for a team as their sixth man. It seems like if you're if you're trading for him, you're looking for him to be your point guard for the rest of the season. And that's 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 fair. He's, he's proven that he can do that. He's been a phenomenal player for a few years. He's a champion, so Kyle Lowry, I think, could very well be on the move. All right, let's shift to someone else because I don't I I saw this name as I was going through guys who could potentially be traded or who could be bought out, and this one was a little surprising, and I it it has not worked out for Otto Porter and the Chicago Bulls. They signed him. They thought you know what, we'll bring him in, and he can kind of push us over the top. The Bulls aren't going anywhere. The Bulls are not going to be winning right now and not next year. It is time 
to buy out and move off each other. Otto Porter Jr. and the Bulls are are sh- they should be heading for a divorce. It didn't work out. You can just say, "Hey, we tried. We went for it a bit. We brought in a big free agent, and it just it didn't happen." I mean, he's a former third overall pick. The Wizards got him, brought him in for his career, eleven points a game, five rebounds. It wasn't quite what you would hope when you took him third overall. You thought maybe you'd get a little bit more. Tried, tried, they tried pairing him with Bradley Beal, John Wall, and it just, for Washington, it didn't work out. And then when he became a restricted free agent, it was the Kings that originally, they had targeted him, and the Wizards brought him back. Oh, and then it, it didn't work out, and so Washington said, you know what, we're going to move off, and traded them to Chicago. Now, with Chicago, it hasn't been the best of times. He's only played in 45 games for them, so it hasn't been great. 13 points a game for them. So it's been it's been tough sledding for him. Now, if you're one of these teams that is targeting Otto and you're hoping to bring him in after being bought out, you're not looking for him to be your number one guy. You're looking for added depth. The Nets, get some wing wing help. Look at the Lakers. The Lakers are always looking to add pieces and add a body and along a 6'9 wing. It's, it's You can bring those in, and especially if he's coming to a team and he's not going to be the focus of the offense. It's, it's not things are going to run through Otto Porter. It's, hey, can you come in? Can you knock down some shots? Can you, when the ball gets to you, make the right move? Make the right play? He's a career 40% three-point shooter. Every team will take that. You can always hope that, okay, give us 40%. We'll we'll live with that. We'll take that. We want that. Again, he's not going to come in and be a knockdown sniper or be your best player, be your second best. But none of these teams who are on the buyout market are looking for you to do that. They want an added piece, some added depth, and to provide some firepower coming off the bench or even if you want to insert him into the starting lineup. I think most of the time, for a guy like Otto, it, at this point, it'd be you're coming off the bench. You're going to try and help a team, add some depth to their to their lineup, and overall be just a guy to them. You're not the number one. It's kind of like when the Lakers went and got Markeith Morris. It was, we're not expecting a ton from you. We're not asking you to do a whole lot. We want you to come in, knock some shots, be a part of this team, and be a solid solid role player for us. There's going to be a lot less pressure. You're not going to be looked at as, we need you to score. We're dependent on it. So I think he could really come in and help a lot of teams. You look at, could he help the Nuggets? Could be a good move for the Nuggets to look at. The Clippers, who they would like to add some more guys. Their scoring, besides Kawhi and PG, fades at times. So you add in another shooter. You can spread the ball. It, It... Otto Porter will be an interesting guy to see where he goes. I heard that the Warriors were looking at him possibly. Now, if the Warriors got him, you got to wonder what what are they what are they looking to do? Obviously, they would be trying to be a playoff team, and they're right in that eight seed right now, and they got to make a push and figure some things out. But you add in a forty percent three point shooter, it allows them some more depth on their bench. So the Warriors would be really interesting. It's it's not a move where they go. Okay, now I can take the Warriors serious. It's something that could help them and allows them, hey, the you have some help behind Kelly Oubre and Andrew Wiggins, and it doesn't force Steph to be the guy shooting so much every game and relying. It gives him some help and he's long enough that he can play defense for you. So it'd be it'd be very interesting to see what happens with Otto Porter Jr. if he does get bought out. For the Warriors, a team shooting 36% from the three, bringing in a guy who's shooting 40% would be very, very helpful. So look for Otto Porter Jr. to be, if he gets bought out, heavily coveted because you get in a third overall pick, former third overall pick that is still only 27. You think you can figure out a way to integrate him into the offense? Yeah, Even if he was into that Robert Covington role that he plays with the with the Blazers, with 
completely fit there. Give him a little three and D. I, I would, uh, I would like to see who Otto Porter ends up with. He could be one of those not swinging moves that pushes a team over the top, but could really help solidify a team's bench unit and be a big depth piece. The biggest guy who I look at and is being shopped heavily and is not even playing at the moment because the Cavaliers are trying to trade Andre Drummond. Drummond can be a huge piece for anyone that adds him and can take them over the top. If you look at Drummond, he is the force that you want behind protecting the the basket. You don't need him to give you a ton on offense. He can. He's a double-double machine. If you bring in this guy who eats this year before he was benched 17 and a half and 13 and a half, re- 17 and a half points, 13 and a half rebounds. You're getting almost 14 rebounds a game from him. Every team can use that. He's 27. Again, he was the ninth overall pick and yeah, it didn't work out in Detroit. He went to Cleveland. I, I didn't understand the move when Cleveland made it. It was what are you, you're not really going for anything and this guy seemed like someone you would want going to a a contender and being a piece for them but again in 25 games this year 17 and a half points 13 and a half rebounds he's averaging 1.2 blocks he's gonna be giving you stuff on on the defense side he's 9.4 rebounds a game on defense four offensive rebounds a game so you could bring in an Andre Drummond. Now, that's the move that I thought the Nets should have really hoped for. That, hey, if Andre Drummond gets bought out, that's the guy you want to go for. That's that's who you could really help push you over the top. Allow for some less DeAndre Jordan minutes. You can kind of pair those two together of replacing one another. They went with Blake, and we'll see how it goes. But I, I look for Andre Drummond. I heard that the Lakers were interested in him. They prefer him over Boogie Cousins. Obviously, Boogie was coming off the big injuries. And Drummond adding to the Lakers, it, it gives him even more size. It, you know, Anthony Davis doesn't like to play the center, and he's been banged up. Him and Marcus Saul kind of trading off the center's duties. It, it'd be interesting to see the Lakers get him. And you wonder, would he come off the bench for them? Would he be their their first big man off the bench? in that Dwight JaVale role from last year and try and see if they can recreate those twin towers right there with him and Gasol. Cause you wouldn't necessarily play those two together. You'd play them opposite, but Anthony Davis with Drummond, that's good luck driving to the basket in that you're, you're going to get swatted. It's, it's not happening. You're you're not getting to the cup. So I look for Andre Drummond to be the big piece of obviously the Cavs are trying to trade him. They have had him sit for a while now in trying to trade him so he wouldn't get hurt. If they can't make the trade happen and they buy him out and they they work out something and he's a free agent, he's going to be a highly touted asset and he could he could be a player that really swings things in favor of one of these teams if they can bring in Andre Drummond because again, he's 27, 17 and a half points, 13 and a half rebounds. You're getting a good player who's still young big physical guy so it'd be really interesting so those are some guys that I look for on the buyout or trade market I'm really interested to see what happens and goes on as we get closer to the deadline which is now about two weeks away the 25th of March so very exciting trade deadline can always be kind of hectic and crazy we've already seen some big trades this season so expect more things to happen coming up let's talk about some buyers and sellers as I mentioned the trade deadline is going to be coming up which teams are looking to buy? Which teams are looking to sell? Some teams are being have been surprising as a in the playoff race right now. So they probably won't be sellers. Could they be buyers? We'll get into that next. It's the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC, GSMC Podcast Network. Come on back.
check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Alrighty, welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. So we are in the middle of the All-Star break going on, no games. I accidentally, I said earlier at the beginning of the show that no games till Thursday. I was mistaken. It's no games until Wednesday, so luckily we do get NBA back here sooner rather than later. The Wizards and the Grizzlies will match up, as well as the Spurs and the Magic Ma- Mavericks. So, ooh, big game right there. That has some... Playoff spots potential as the Mavs sit in the eighth seed right now and the Spurs sit at the seventh seed. So that's going to be a big game for both of those teams. As you want to, you got to, you got to get those wins against those teams you're going to be fighting for those spots for because you don't want to be in the play in tournament if you're one of them. And being in the sixth spot allows you not to be in there. So look for those games as they'll get back to action here on Wednesday, March 10th. So better. We go. We get uh, one less day of without basketball, so that's nice. As these guys are on the break, much deserved. Just had the All Star game and Team LeBron won. And I, I, I will get into something Giannis tweeted out after the game about LeBron that I found interesting. As I was, I was sitting there today and yesterday thinking about, and it made me go, "Huh, I wonder, wonder what his path could be after this." So we'll get into that at the end of the show. But right now, I want to talk about. The buyers and the sellers who could be a buyer, who could be a seller coming this trade deadline. Obviously, I was talking about players who could be traded or bought out. Now there's going to be teams who are looking to make some moves and and whether they're going to be sellers or buyers. Now, obviously, the second half of the season is going to get started here on Wednesday, like I just reset. And with teams like the Knicks and the Hornets being in playoff positions, usually you'd look and you'd look at those teams and go, okay, maybe we could buy from them and be, they'd be sellers. Now, I don't think those teams will be sellers because they are within range of a playoff spot and they are surprising a lot of people. I don't look at them as necessarily going to be buyers either. I mean, I just can't see the Knicks pushing their chips in and thinking, okay, well, we're sitting in the fifth spot. Let's let's get to that fourth spot and, and be... It, it's just... I don't see that happening. I just... I. With those two teams, it doesn't make sense. You you don't you're not gonna go trying to bring in a big time piece to just have you make it to the second round. I, I I don't I don't that makes no sense to me. You enjoy what the season you're having right now. It's uh props to the Knicks who it's been a long time since they've been in the playoff discussion or even talked about as a potential playoff team. The same thing goes. For the Hornets, who it's not been as long since they've been a playoff team, but for actually being an exciting playoff team and a, uh, someone who you go, wow, they're they're really surprising. We didn't expect this this year. I mean, they've been, I, I said it on a podcast a couple weeks ago, the Hornets are the most fun team to watch. Now, they're not going to win every game. They're going to lose some games badly, but they're fun to watch. They will not, they won't go away. They're, they're scrappy as all being. So... I want to focus on some of these teams who, for the sellers, maybe it was things didn't quite click this year, and it didn't work out the way they had hoped, and it's time for them to kind of get a fresh start and maybe move off some guys, 
because you want to open up some cap space and you want to get off some of these contracts. And the first team that really comes to mind for me is one of the teams who has probably been, I don't want to say the most disappointing, but have definitely underperformed and they have now fired their head coach and got a new voice in there. And they could be looking to move off some guys, especially one guy in particular who would be a a candidate for his rest, he's restricted free agent heading into the offseason. And that's the Atlanta Hawks. That's the first team that comes to mind when you look at these sellers at the deadline and having pieces who can contribute to teams. John Collins is a name that has to get tossed around as a potential trade piece. You've heard that the Warriors could possibly want him. I don't necessarily see the Warriors going for him, especially for a package that would have to include, you'd imagine, that Wolves unprotected pick. He's not a big enough player to warrant that. And it would be just where would he fit in with that team with Draymond Green being there and James Wiseman? I don't see it. But you could see John Collins getting traded and going and helping out some teams. He's a 6'9 power forward. He's long. He's athletic. He's not going to give you the most on defense, which I think it's more about effort with him. And you, if he was on maybe a more winning team and a more stable franchise, you might be able to unlock that. He is only, again, he's, he's only in his third year. And he's only 23. So there's still a lot of growth for him. He's averaging 18 points this year. You would like a little bit more rebounds from him, only at 7.6 a game. But again, if you traded for him, you are getting a guy who's going to be a restricted free agent. So is he someone that you want to bring in and potentially lose next year? Or someone that you'd want to bring in and then you would have to pay him Because you don't want him walking away, but if he is a free agent and he's restricted, that means that other teams can offer him a big contract. And would you be willing to match that? Because you'd obviously have the opportunity to match it, but is John Collins worth that? I don't think he's shown necessarily that he would warrant a big-time extension from you. Now, you you wouldn't want to lose him for anything right away, so it'd be a tough spot. Because, yeah, he is restricted. But what do you do? What, what what would you do with him? And so it's... It'd be an interesting question to see what does someone, what does someone view, view his value? Where does he stand? Now, if you go and trade for him and you don't give up necessarily a ton of picks or a ton of players or capital, then you go, okay, we're okay with letting him walk if some team wanted to pay him big if he didn't perform for you the right way. But if he did perform for you and he did unlock something inside of him that has been holding him back, maybe it was the Hawks who you can look at the Hawks and go, they haven't been the most stable of franchises. It, they are not necessarily developing guys at the rate that you would hope they are. So maybe it is Atlanta. Maybe that's the problem with him. And he a fresh start would do wonders for him. Or it's maybe a guy that just doesn't quite have it at the elite level that you had hoped for that you thought maybe you were getting from him out of Wake Forest. Again, he was the 19th overall pick, so it's not a lottery guy that was super high that's a bust. But it's someone that you kind of had looked at and went, huh, we haven't quite figured out what he does great at, where he kind of fits in a role. And maybe if he was off the Hawks, he'd be able to figure that out and find a more comfortable spot for him. So I'd look for the Hawks, who also have Tony Snell, who can come in and be a wing for any team can be a knockdown shooter when you need to, and just provide that kind of depth to anybody, especially with Bogdan Bogdanovich coming back. You're looking at there's going to be even less minutes for him. It hasn't been a season where he's playing a ton for the Hawks, only 23 games. So you look for him maybe to want a fresh start, maybe to get traded, get some assets back if you're the Hawks, because this season, again, it has not gone the way you had hoped. It's you were potentially going to be a playoff team and that was the goal well it didn't work out that way and you're now one of the worst teams so why not trade away some guys and get some value back for next year and moving towards the future because these guys John Collins could be in the plan for them but again he's going to be a restricted free agent if it's not worked in Atlanta for the last three years what's to say another four happens they might be looking to move off of him. They might not want him 
they might not match any team's offer. So why not trade him and get some value there? And Tony Snell is a veteran who's been around that you can trade him somewhere and he will give some teams some help that's maybe in a more winning situation. And for the Hawks, you trade off a guy who you didn't have a long-term future for anyways. And so it's no harm, no foul. And you get some pieces back for him. Maybe not anything, not anything great, but you do move off of him and you go, all right, well, it works out that now in his last year of his deal, we're moving off of him. He's going to be an unrestricted free agent, but we were able to get some some stuff back from, from him. And it wasn't just a waste. So I would look at the Hawks as being a seller. Another team that I look at is the Orlando Magic. Now, the Magic have a big name piece that they just signed to a contract extension this offseason. And for someone that is, for a team that is 14th in the East, and it just does not look good for them at all. It's It's been a struggle this season. They're the fourth worst team in the NBA. You have Nikola Vucevic, who is one of the top players in the league at his position. The guy is averaging 24.6 points per game, 11.6 rebounds, shooting 48% from the field, 41 from three. He is a game-changing player. You just signed him to a new contract extension. So you won't necessarily want to move him just for for nothing. There, there's no reason to do that. He can bring in a big time return. And it's he's he's making twenty six million this year. His average salary is twenty five after you gave him that contract extension. He is twenty nine, so now would be the best time to move him. You move him to a team and he gives them Two more years of control before it hit free agency so they could get some more usage out of him. You could get back a piece or pieces moving forward that can help you build to, towards the future if you're the Magic. Because right now, Vucevic is a, a win-now type player. He's going to help a team be able to do that and be a piece that can contribute to a championship-level team if in the right organi- organization. And you've heard teams like the Celtics be linked to him. It'd be interesting if the Celtics went and got him because they have Daniel Tice and they have Tristan Thompson playing the center position. Obviously, Vucevic is better than both of those guys. Now, would it make a lot of sense for them to go get that? Could they go get him? What would they have to give up for Vucevic? I You would have to look and, oh, man, if, if you're the Celtics, it's do you have enough to go get him? Is that the piece... That puts you over the top. Could you see the Heat go get him? Do the Spurs want to add him? If they see, hey, we're still in that playoff mix. We're just missing a couple pieces to push us over the top and move towards getting out of that play-in tournament area. And adding Vucevic, it extends their window of, hey, we're still pushing towards playoffs currently. And we have, he's, he's young enough that we'd have him for the next couple years. He's a knockdown shooter. He's one of the the best big men that is in the game right now. It would allow them to move off LaMarcus Aldridge after this season pretty easily, and you replace him right away. So Vucevic and the Magic going to a divorce would be very interesting. Obviously, the Magic would look to get a nice haul in, retor- in return. And then sticking with the Magic, another, another guy that you could see being moved is possibly Eric Gordon. I mean, Aaron Gordon, excuse me, I said Eric. Not, not the, although Eric Gordon could be traded also by the Rockets if with them being one of the worst teams in the NBA and looking to shed some contracts, him, P.J. Tucker. But sticking with the Magic and Aaron Gordon, who Gordon's been hurt this, a lot of this season, so it hasn't been the best terms of showcasing his abilities for teams because he is dealing with some injuries, so you haven't been able to get the most out of him, but could a guy like a Terrence Ross be someone that a team looks at and goes, ooh, we would really like a 3 and D type player. Let's get him in here. He's signed long-term for the next couple years, so you would have some more years out of him. Now, if you're a team that's just looking for a one and done and you don't want to attach long-term money to him, obviously then you move off of that and you go, 
yeah, we're not going to go. We don't want to pay twelve million next year for him. That's that's not in our budget. We're looking for an expiring contract. Then you go, okay, so Terrence Ross is in the fit somewhere. But there are going to be teams that want to pair him with long-term goals and have it be, hey, for the next two years, we do want a Terrence Ross guy. We think that's a piece that could really help us moving forward and contribute right now and next year and be a guy who comes off the bench and provides that spark for them. Now, if Evan Fournier was more healthy, I could see him being dealt, but he's been dealing with a groin injury. So it, it's it's interesting. It, it, the Magic, I'd look for them to be a, a seller. I don't, I don't see Vucevic being on the team past the trade deadline. Now they could end up keeping the USC product and, and not moving off of him and saying, hey, we have this guy for another year. Let's get Markel Fultz back healthy. Let's get a nice draft pick in this draft. Pair him with Fultz, Vucevic, and really figure things out in the East. But that just seems very wishful thinking. I think now's the time if you're the Magic. Busevich is at his prime spot right now. He's playing fantastic for you. Move off him while the iron's still hot. He's His value has never been higher right now, and it will only go downhill moving forward. If you can move off him, I think now's the time to do it. I want to get some buyers really for the last five minutes of this segment. I One team that stood out to me the most as a potential buyer. The Portland Trailblazers. Portland, once CJ McCollum went down with the injury and Yusuf Nurkic, they were kind of written off as, all right, well, it's not like they can do anything this season now. They lost their se- two, two of their second best player and their third best player. Now, they still have Dame Lillard. So you look at Portland, you go, okay, well, they were always going to be fun and competitive to watch because that's what Dame does. That's just who he is, and that's in his nature, that he's just going to keep fighting for you. And no matter what, you are going to be within a playoff position. But right now, Portland's at 21-14. and They're in the fifth spot. They're not far back of the the fourth spot or the third. Now, if they were able to get C.J. McCollum back here healthy, who he's still going to be out for a little while, Yusuf Nurkic, Nurkic will be coming back here shortly as well. And you look at this team and go, okay, well, they should have playoff implications. They should think that they can go deep if they get these guys back. Because of the fact that without them, they've still been able to stay afloat, be in that running for a top four spot. And once you get into the playoffs, if you have a guy like Dame Lillard, who's one of the best players in the league, then you are automatically a, a threat. And in a, in a Western conference that is very tough and has a lot of teams that look at that look at that conference and go, we can take down the Jazz or we can beat the Lakers or the Clippers or if one of those teams gets knocked out, then we should be the favorite. Or any given day, a team in the West can just, who knows what happens. It's, it's the wild, wild West. I look at Portland as being a team that really could use to make a mute move. Uh, could really use making a big move to add some depth to that team. They have Robert Covington, who they traded for in this offseason. Anthony Simmons coming off the slam dunk championship has been a good piece for them that's still on his rookie deal. Gary Trent Jr. is in the running for, or should have been in the running for a sixth man of the year, but because he's had to play more minutes and start for them with uh, CJ McCollum going down, it looks about like they won't be be able to he won't be it's sixth man of the year. So but he's been a huge spark for them and has provided them to help keep them afloat, which has been surprising because again, once CJ and Nurkic went down, it was well, there goes Portland's chances of winning anything. There goes maybe they can be in that Maybe they'll be in that range of the play-in tournament by the time those guys get healthy and they'll give them that big push. But getting 15.2 points a game from Gary Trent, 40% from three, has really kept Portland afloat and kept them in that range. So look for them to be a buyer at the at the deadline. Because again, they're sitting in that fifth spot. They're right in that range and they're about to get CJ and Nurkic back. So Portland, look out for them. And they will be, I think, 
uh, big time buyers to make at least one big move. The last buyer I wanted to look at, I talked about them a little bit in the last segment, having them being linked to Otto Porter Jr. That's the Golden State Warriors. This is a team who has been, I don't want to say mediocre, but that's probably the best term, is that they have been mediocre. And some days they look really, really good. And Steph Curry has played like an MVP. Other nights, it's been really, really bad for them. And they do have some bad losses that you look at and could hurt them in the long run. The blowing some leads, give having a loss against the Magic, or blowing that lead against the Magic in that uh in Orlando and the comeback by the Hornets against them. But they do have some comeback wins against the Lakers and the Clippers. And so you look at them and they've really been what their record is of nineteen and eighteen and kind of hot and cold. Now, if they go out and they're able to make a trade and they've been linked to Victor Oladipo, who it would be tough for them to go and get because, again, he's not worthy of giving up that Wolves pick. That's the most valuable asset that they have right now. They still do have the traded, uh, the disabled player, no, the trade exception, excuse me, from DeAndre Iguodala deal, uh, deal from last year. So they could use to get that to add a guy. I would have said at the beginning of the season with the Knicks not being looked at as a playoff team that they would have been sellers, that you could have gone and got a Austin Rivers or an Alec Burks from them, and that would have really helped the Warriors and their shooting and providing Steph with another ball handler because Brad Wanamaker has struggled mightily for the Warriors. And you really need to go find a backup point guard for them. And so I think that would be their biggest need right now. You also need more shooting because this team is not a great three-point shooting team, which is weird to say for the Warriors, especially for the years of the Splash Brothers and Kevin Durant. So those are going to be the buyers and sellers, I think, the most at the deadline. Obviously, some of these bigger-name teams will be right in the market for the buyouts and be making moves and savvy veteran moves and doing what teams who are winning teams do. But these sellers and these buyers, I think, could, uh, could use the most about going and swinging a trade and helping their cause for a playoff run. For the, To finish up today, I want to talk about LeBron James because last night, as I'm recording this on Monday, March 8th, his team won the All-Star game pretty handily. So Team LeBron won, beating Team Durant. And Giannis was named the MVP. And LeBron congratulated him. And Giannis had an interesting thing to tweet about, and it got me thinking what LeBron's future could be post-career. So we'll get into that next. To finish off, it's the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Come on back. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. Thank you so much for sticking around, tuning in. Always appreciate it. Feel free to go and give us a feedback on anywhere you can. Reply to us on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, anywhere, at GSMC Basketball. And then go ahead and feel free to reach out to me if you have any thoughts, comments, or you want me to talk about anything basketball-related. At Mr. Meowser on Twitter. Same thing on Instagram. It's been a lot of fun. We got the trade deadline going on here shortly. We got some teams that could be buyers, sellers. Nets add Blake Griffin. Did that take them over the top? Eh, 
I'd hold off on saying that. We are in the All-Star break. The All-Star game happened last night as I record this on Monday the 8th. And Team LeBron proved to a a dominant victory over Team Durant, 170-150. to They won every single quarter. So they did it, uh, the new format where you go by quarters. And if you win, then it's a certain amount goes to charity and you start over. And so it's 0-0 in the second quarter, 0-0 in the third. And then for the fourth quarter, it's going to a certain amount of points. So whatever your total was, add the 24. And that's your, your target goal. And so Team LeBron won every single quarter and got to their target goal. And they beat Team Durant. Now, since they switched this new format of instead of East versus West, you have the team captains, and they get voted on by the fans, and the top two vote getters in each conference become the captains of the team. And for four years, LeBron James has been voted the team captain. And so he's been the team captain for Team LeBron, obviously by the name. And since they've switched this new format, LeBron James's teams in the in the All-Star game sit with a perfect record of 4-0. Now you look at it and you go, okay, well, it's the All-Star game. There's these teams are pretty stacked and they have some really good players. But LeBron James tweeted that Giannis, who was on Team LeBron as he was the first pick by LeBron, who Giannis won the All-Star Game MVP, the Kobe Bryant Award, which was renamed uh to honor Kobe Bryant after his passing last year. And Giannis responded back to LeBron, thanking him and calling, saying, you would make, you will make a great GM one day. So Giannis, who had said earlier in the week to reporters, it's over. It's over. Yeah, it's over, guys. We got this in the bag when he found out what the starting lineup was. Starting lineup was himself, LeBron James, Steph Curry, Luka Doncic, and Nikola Jokic. And you look at that team, you go, well, damn, that's a pretty good team. Like, that's that's a solid starting lineup. That's some of the best players, obviously, in the game because it is an all-star game. But the interesting thing was what Giannis tweeted at back out to LeBron, saying he would make a great GM one day. And it got me thinking. Obviously, LeBron is on the downside of his career, although the way he's playing and being in the MVP conversation, once again, we don't know when that end of the line is going to be. He could still be playing for another... He could be doing the Tom Brady route of everyone saying, oh, he's he's, he's finished, he's getting done and getting done. And yet, all he keeps doing is winning and winning titles and being in that conversation and continuing that conversation of greatest player Ever. But when his time does come and his NBA career is over, which hopefully and it doesn't look like it will be anytime soon right now, what is his next phase in his career? Obviously, he's earned enough money that he could go the route of being an owner. But would he want to be an owner? I I think he would want to be an owner. It would make a lot of sense. He would have... He would have a lot of say and a lot of power and be able to sit in with the league and continue to try and improve the league in the image that he sees that it should be in and have that voice and be in the owner's meeting and be be that guy. So I could 100% see him being an owner one day. As he stated, he would, he would like to be an owner and would like a piece to own a team. Or could he go the other route? Could he be a coach? Could you see LeBron James on the sideline coaching up his team like Larry Bird once did? Bill Russell was a coach. Doc Rivers is a coach. Former players, they, they, they like to be coached. Steve Nash, when a, a great player being a coach. You don't see those greats doing it all the time. And I look at the, a coach, and I don't see that as the position for LeBron because, it, to me, everything has come so natural to him and so much so much easier than everyone else. I mean, yes, he's put in a tremendous amount of work and has worked hard to be at the level he at, he's at. And he puts in so much effort and practice time. 
But again, he's naturally gifted and is one of the greatest, if not the greatest basketball player ever. So coaching, I, I find it hard because, again, he try explaining to someone how to do something that's came so easy to you would be difficult and very frustrating. And for some of those big-time guys and some of the greatest, it just the coaching and not being able to just do it. Why can't you just do it? Would be a challenge. And to have to go head-to-head against the guy who's the, the new face of the team, would the ego be able to allow that? Uh, I, I, I don't know. Because to, to be so great, you have to have an ego. It's what comes with it almost. It's that, yeah, your competitive drive, but you have to be able to look in the mirror and go, I am the best player in this game. No one's better than me. And it, it what's, it's what drives you to be so competitive and so wanting to be great is that you look at it and you go, I am the best. And trust me, LeBron has no sort of shortage of ego. But rightfully so, he deserves to have an ego because he has been one of the best players of his generation and of all time. So if coach is out, owner's a possibility, there's another role that I think he would really thrive in or want to be, and that's an executive or GM and being in that position of roster configuration, making moves, similar to what Jerry West has been. And Jerry West is probably the the top guy in, in, in my eyes. Pat Riley's right there also. But Jerry West has been a force in the league, helping turn around the Warriors, getting the Clippers in the right foot. It would be a move that LeBron could make that Michael Jordan didn't have a success at or didn't take that role of being the guy putting together the team, putting together a roster. Michael Jordan owns the Hornets and he has a strong say in that team and what moves they're making and what's the final decision. He talked about LaMelo Ball and how he's exceeded those expectations. Of course, Michael had probably final say in if they were going to take LaMelo or not. But it's not that executive role to where he is the decision maker. He is the guy who's approaching the owner saying, this is what we should do. This is the right move. This is the plan. That's Mitch Kupchak for the Hornets. He's the GM. Now, if LeBron wanted to, and he went and became an executive, and he won, or he was good like Jerry West, or... Or Pat Riley, who Riley had that coaching career to where he won titles and then moved into the executive role. And he's been able to bring the Heat some titles. He he won the three-peat, or the, the two-peat, excuse me, with LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and Miami. He brought that big three there. He had the title with Shaq and Dwayne Wade as the coach and moved into the executive and still won titles and still was able to be that guy who brought in big-time free agents, Bosch, LeBron, traded for guys, brought in Jimmy Butler, drafted Bam Adebayo, drafted Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero, has had that success. And you look at it and you go, LeBron bought into that Miami Heat culture when he arrived. And it was Pat Riley kind of showing him how things are supposed to be done, how an organization should be run. Couldn't you see LeBron being a GM? Being a guy that's running the team and putting the pieces like a chess like a chessboard. Doesn't that suit him? To be able to go? Hasn't he already been trying to do that in the first place? Take away the All-Star game and the 4-0 and his teams that he's picked are 4-0. Yeah, most of the time, it's, it's an All-Star game. It's happened. Yeah, guys are trying. But again, it's not... It's not at that level of, okay, well, everyone's putting in their all effort or this is taken so serious. If LeBron was a GM and he's already had say in moves, because when you have, when you are the best player on a team, that team should look to you and ask you, okay, well, what do you think we should be doing? 
It's what the Houston Texans should have been doing with Deshaun Watson. Instead of trading his best weapon in DeAndre Hopkins, go ask him, hey, what do you want? What what head coach should we go be going should we be going for? And we've seen how that works out, and it's not well. It's not going well. But when you're a star player, you should be informed of decisions that are going on. You should have say. You should be looked at as, okay, what, what do you think we should be doing? Now, I'm not saying you control everything and you go, okay, well, I'm, I'm not playing if you don't go and get this guy. Like Kawhi Leonard, who when he said, Clippers, you go get Paul George and I'm coming. But if you don't get Paul George, I'm not coming there. That hasn't worked out so great so far. We'll see what happens with them. So you want to be careful about giving a player too much power. And LeBron James, who kind of began the player empowerment movement, when he made his decision, it it changed the way free agency happened for the NBA. Guys like Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, were able to walk away and leave their franchises and go find greener pastures. It had changed that guys were more willing to, hey, I'm not going to... I'm not going to play here. I don't want to be here. I want to be traded. I want to go somewhere else. He kind of initiated that player empowerment movement. Now, yes, some of the teams that he had helped construct won titles and brought in pieces to push them over the top. He also helped get some guys paid that didn't work out so well in the end. I mean, you look at it in the the temp. Tristan Thompson deal for the Cavs. While it worked out, for the time being, it became a hindrance. And once LeBron was gone, wasn't a great deal anymore. Tristan Thompson wasn't that same guy that helped contribute to winning a title. Same thing for the J.R. Smith deal. But LeBron did help him bring in Iman Shumpert and help to contribute to winning a title. So he has had say in teams to where pieces that he maybe have pushed the team to go and bring in came in, and they won titles, and they got stuff done. Now, when he left, it left that team with a big mess because they did pay his guys and gave them big contracts. And once you don't have LeBron James on your team, you might not be a championship-level team anymore. Ask the Heat. Ask the Cavs. What were the Lakers before they had LeBron for this time being? It was, oh, we are in the lottery or the top five picking as opposed to winning a title like last year. So LeBron in himself can be a championship team. We've seen it. He went to eight straight finals with the Heat and and Cavs. By him, not by himself, but he was the guy who went to eight straight finals. So you have LeBron. He's a championship player. He is a championship team essentially. Now, if he was in the executive role and he's not there, he's not the player and his eye for the game or talent scouting, is it still at that level? Is he able to go find a guy and bring him in? Could he tell someone, I'm not going to pay you that deal or that's not the move we want to make as a franchise? Could he tell that to the star player? Could he swing that deal to if he's attached to the team? Would that attract someone? You look at what Kevin Durant said before he came to the Warriors. Or after he came to the Warriors. And obviously, the attraction of going and playing with a guy like Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, at the time, Draymond Green, and being a part of that group drew Kevin Durant there. And he wanted to be a part of that. But also, it was Jerry West being there. And the influence of the logo. And hearing what Jerry had to say made that move even easier and better. Yes, Steph Curry was there, and you want to go play with a guy like Steph and the ball movement and the shooting and the freedom that Golden State provided him. But Jerry West had influence. Being attached to the Warriors was something that helped them because they had the logo attached to their team. He was helping run things and make moves for them and what to do and not to do. He's the guy who got credited for saying we should not trade Klay Thompson for Kevin Love, which was something that was being floated around after the, was that the 17 finals? And so you look at it and you go, okay, well, with LeBron James being an executive with the team, would that help draw in big name talent? Or would guys not want to go there? Because are you always going to be 
overshadowed by LeBron, even when his playing career is over, even when he's done, if you are the star of the team and you're now the best player, are you going to be overshadowed? Is that part of the reason what's happened to the Hornets until they, they, they can't get that big free agent guy? Yeah, they're in Charlotte, so that doesn't help, and you're not looking at them as the big uh, free agent destination. But if you go there, you're in Michael Jordan's shadow. It's the way it is. It's Michael Jordan. Now, he's the owner of the team, so that helps that you're going to be playing for Michael Jordan, and you're not go into a team that's run necessarily by Michael full force because he has help. He has guys that do the day-to-day things. But you mainly look at Chicago. They had Derrick Rose who won an MVP. But every guy that gets drafted to Chicago is compared to one player, and that's Michael Jordan. And no one's able to live up to that because no one else is Michael Jordan. Now, if you go to his team, you're going to be looked at as, okay, well, Michael owns this team. He's looking at you. He drafted you to be the guy. He sees something in you, which can be a huge confidence boost and help guys if they are up to the task. But also, that's a lot to burden. That's a lot to carry. If LeBron was the owner, if he was the executive, would that fuel you more that he saw something in me that I want to live up to whatever expectation he's he has? Or would you crumble under the weight of trying to live up to him choosing you and saying that you are good enough to lead this team or be that top draft pick or top free agent signing? It's extremely interesting to think about. And would he make a good executive? Could he see who's the right player, how this team would fit, what could they build together? Could he negotiate with someone and tell them, hey, you're not worth that contract. We're not paying you that. I'm all about player empowerment, but you're not worth that money. Could he do that? It'd be, it's, I would never bet against LeBron in doing anything. He is too talented, has been too successful. And maybe he doesn't want any of that. Maybe he doesn't want to be an executive. Maybe he doesn't want to be a coach. And he wants to go help build an empire and make movies and TV series and executive produce. But he loves the game of basketball. And we all know that. And it's always a wonder with these all-time great guys of what are they going to do once their career is over. And for LeBron, he still has time to think about that. But judging from what Giannis felt and what he said, and while it could easily be a joke by Giannis, he was the number one overall pick by LeBron. So he's going to, hey... You made a you made a great choice and made a great team pick, but you look at it and in these All Star games, LeBron has picked great teams and they are four zero. Now it'd be a whole different ball game if he was picking from a pool of rookies, free agents. I think it'd be super interesting to see what would happen if LeBron became an executive. Could he follow in the shadows of the Jerry West, of the Pat Rileys? Would he want to be an owner like a Michael Jordan? Would that allow him to go head-to-head against Jordan once again by two owners who are looked at as the two greatest players in the game? They now own teams, and could those teams match up against each other? If he went and bought the Cavaliers and they knocked out the Charlotte Hornets, all of it would be super interesting, and I am here for it, and I would love to see what the next phase in his career is and how he decides to approach it. And so I'm, I'm excited. Now I hope it takes... A little bit of time because I still want to see LeBron James play basketball. He's still playing at an elite level. I mean, he's in the MVP conversation. So I don't think it's in the near future. But it's going to be here quicker than we think. And I'm excited to see what would be the next phase for LeBron. And could he go and be an executive or an owner or even a coach? All right, that's going to do it for the GSMC Basketball Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I want to thank you guys for tuning in, sticking around, and listening all the way through. If you can, give us a nice review, share us, retweet, send it to your friends, subscribe, do whatever you can. Just keep on listening. We always appreciate it. And I'll talk to you guys later this week. Have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. 
part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.